Yeah, I'm, I'm Simon Gunn from the uh, Centre for Urban History here at Leicester. Um, I suppose I've been working on the history of industrial cities now for about 30 years. And I started out not on that topic exactly. I started out doing a PhD on the history of the middle class, how a notion of the middle class came into being. Uh, in England in the early to mid 19th uh, century and I went to do a PhD at Manchester which then was a, a very sort of um, gloomy uh, big sort of gloomy city with uh, a lot of uh, depression in it at the time this was the time of the Smiths and of, of uh, uh, Mrs. Thatcher and so on and so forth. So I got involved in doing history there then and what I really noticed in a way was what really struck me was the relationship if you like between this middle class and this extraordinary physical environment that the city represented. I'm talking here about town hall, I'm talking about warehouses, enormous mills, factories and so on and so forth. And I became increasingly, um, if you like, involved with the relationship between people and their material surroundings. I didn't think you could look at the idea of the middle class simply as an idea on paper, so to speak. But this was something that involved the, the, the whole way in which people related to their material surroundings. Um, so I did that project and I wrote a book out of it, but later on, I suppose um, about five years ago or so, I started to get interested in the other end of that process. What had happened to these industrial cities at the point where, uh, as indeed in the 1980s, where they were beginning to crumble, where their, if you like, historical role was in question. And I started to work on uh, what one might term deindustrialization, particularly since 1945 or so. So my work since then has been on a variety of aspects of this. I've looked at post-war planning, trying to think about, for example, what the industrial city might have looked like, what people thought an industrial city might have looked like in the 20th century, especially in these cities like Leeds and Birmingham and Manchester and places big cities, but which are very much, if you like, overdetermined by their 19th century inheritance. What did people think that, that, that would become of Manchester or, or a place like that? How was it going to be an industrial city for the 20th century? Um, so in a sense, Manufacturing Pass, our project, comes out of that uh, whole background. And I guess one of the things that, that has always struck me is how much literature there is on the Industrial Revolution and on urbanisation as part of the Industrial Revolution for the uh, early to mid 19th century, indeed the 19th century as a whole. If you go into the library, there are shelf after shelf of books on 19th century Manchester, on 19th century Birmingham. But if you went into the library and tried to find out about 20th century Birmingham or 20th century Manchester, and particularly its industrial status, you'd be hard pushed to find many things. And especially, I think, really from the 1930s onwards. So again, our project is about trying to fill that kind of gap, to ask, if you like, what happened to these cities? What happened to these places? What happened to the people who lived in these places? who were involved in manufacturing processes, just as their forebears had been in the 19th century. But what happened to them in the 20th? And what kinds of history can we tell about them uh, at that time? If you came to me and said, Simon, I'm interested in what happens to the industrial economy in the uh, 20th century. I could point you to, to a number of books about deindustrialization, economic history books that tell you about industries like hosiery uh, or like uh, textiles generally or like engineering or car industry and so on. You could go away and, and, and bury yourself in those books and find out in considerable detail what happened to um, those industries in the course of the 20th century, their decline and so on and so forth. What you couldn't find out, I think, 
is what happened to the people who worked in those industries and indeed the communities that were built around industries. Nowadays we talk about communities as something that you know we make happen. That communities are, as it were, communities of interest. We're all interested in, uh, I don't know, scuba diving. We have a we have a community of scuba diving or whatever. Uh, or we have a community because we all live in the same place. There's a sort of idea that that, that might be the case. Or there's a hope that that might be the case. But in fact, I would argue that in the past, communities have been based around work. And that's what holds them together. So again, one of the questions that I'm really interested in, in, in thinking about here and researching here is what happens to communities when the work basis through which they've been held together over a long period of time in many cases, sometimes for 200 years, what happens when that goes, often very quickly, and communities are, if you like, forced to live out the consequences of that um, dissolution, might be a good word. What I think manufacturing pass will do is it represents one, um, uh, one means of trying to study precisely the relationship between people and place and activities like work uh, when the uh, economy started to go into a spiraling downturn, particularly after the Second World War, but I guess especially from the 1970s and 1980s. We're not going to concentrate just on the 1970s and 80s. We want to know more about these communities generally in the 20th century anyway. But what, what I think we can do here is to try and provide the resources out of which this kind of history might be written. Uh, the resources are various and, and plentiful, but what we try to do is we try to take one city, Leicester, the city we're in, which has uh, not a typical experience, but one might say a characteristic experience of the 20th century. That is to say, Leicester was quite prosperous for much of the 20th century, but it went into a sudden, rapid decline of its manufacturing base in the 1970s and 1980s, like so many other places. So Leicester has had to reinvent itself, in a way, and that's also part of the story. But the, the kinds of resources that we want to show are in some ways conventional historical sources. We're going to show people um, uh, registers of who worked at particular factories. Uh, we'll look at maps, for example, of factory districts. We'll look at the ways in which the town itself was organized around work and patterns of work, whether that be in engineering or that be in hosiery or boot and shoemaking. We'll look at particular neighborhoods, how they were organized, also using maps, but things like trade directories. But we'll add other sources on as well. We're going to show a lot of visual sources. And in a sense, that goes back to what I said at the beginning about uh, having a strong sense of the relationship between people and their environment, that somehow history often misses out if you like, a visual, physical, material dimension of people and their immediate surroundings. So through photographs, but also I think through oral testimony, which explores to some extent people's relationship to place, we'll begin to put this dimension uh, back in. The aim ultimately is not the resources in themselves, although I like to think that all kinds of different people could use them. I'd like to think that people writing uh, doctorates or books about deindustrialization could use them. But I'd like to think that local historians could use them. I'd like to think that students could use them for projects that they're undertaking in their essays and so on. We're all, as it were, in the business of trying to create histories, but our histories might be of different kinds. But in scholarly terms, what I would really hope that this will contribute to a new social history of deindustrialization in Britain. We have one for the Rust Belt in the States, and it's, it's a very fine historiography, body of historical work in many ways, but we have almost nothing for this country. And which, given that this country is, if you like, the world's first manufacturing nation, is very strange. 
So I think that there's a historical project there that lies behind all this, which is very important. And perhaps even more important, I think that as a country, as a society, we've never really come to terms with that moment. And writing the history of, if you like, deindustrialization is also part, I think, of the process by which we help people and help ourselves perhaps to come to terms with something that was a fairly, for many people, a fairly traumatic historical process within living memory.